Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're looking at a first submission by Natalie of a horse, Bichetto. Uh, Bichetto is a 14-year-old off-the-track thoroughbred that she's been rehabbing for a little while. Taking a quick look at him here, uh, we can see that he's a little bit dropped behind those withers there. We'd like to see that come up and flatten out, and that will happen over time. Now, he had an old bowed tendon. That's pretty normal for an old uh, thoroughbreds coming off the trace track. We used to kind of think of that as normal, kind of they all had that back when I was a kid. They came off the track for one reason or another and went out to pasture and healed up for a while. And, and usually were just fine and very few of them I ever had a problem with after that, so that shouldn't be a problem. We can see that how his belly is kind of distended, how his flanks kind of uh, pooch outwards to the sides there and how his belly is distended downwards. Um, of course he's just standing there now, but Generally speaking, what you see is what you get, so that will certainly improve a little bit when you first start, but just know that you have a ways to go there. We can see muscling-wise, he's pretty much just under uh, uh, developed on the underside of his neck. Not much top line here. But I'm sure it will be in time. Once again, remember, it takes about a year to two years to uh, establish the top line. And uh, coming up the end of that first couple of years just to begin to be able to get the horse to the point. That is if you've been stretching all of this time. So once again, from the point at which you can really get the horse to stretch all the way to the ground, it's going to take a year or so um, to get the horse strong and a couple of years to bring enough strength into the horse to begin to think about collection. So once again, that starts from the point at which you can actually get the horse to stretch every day. Now you're doing a good job here, but he certainly needs to get deeper in all of this. You get some good moments here at times, like right there is where we want him to be. But of course, once we get that stretch and you want to encourage just a little bit more activity in the walk. Now, she's staying kind of behind this horse's eye and a little closer to him because she says he spins around and does things like that. So she's staying where she needs to stay here close to him and a little behind his eye there to keep him going in the right direction. And uh, that's t typical. Um, also, reason why we don't ever want to teach horses to flip around, as we see a lot of Western people doing, teaching people to just put these uh, connectors under the chin and let the horse flip around on you when you lunge. It's always a mistake. Once again, if you're very good at this, you can get away with that. But what happens is most beginners go home from those kind of lessons and start trying that, and pretty soon the horse just flips backwards and forwards, and there isn't much that they can do. So. It's always a good idea. I want my horses to stay out at the end of the line, and when I ask them to stop, they stop, and I come up to them and change direction rather than rather than being lazy about it and letting them kind of do it on their own. Now, Natalie did get hurt on this horse a while back, um, so she's a little trepidatious about it and just taking her time getting started, and that's exactly what you want to do. Unfortunately, so many people get hurt on these uh, on young horses and thoroughbred horses coming off the track, things like this, because they just don't realize how how quick they are and uh, how much time it sort of takes for these horses off the racetrack to, to sort of come down a bit, if you will. We always used to say the best thing to do with thoroughbreds is at least turn them out for three months before you think about trying to start them again into some kind of training just to get them to lose all that hypertension that they have. And of course the problem is if you really know what you're doing, hot horses are no problem to handle and they're handled correctly from the day one. But what happens to most thoroughbreds, unfortunately, that come back from the track is they end up going into the hands of people who actually don't know how to train thoroughbreds. And the first time the horse spooks or something, they react in the wrong way, even if that's petting them on the neck, which is usually the worst thing you can ever do when a horse spooks because you've just rewarded them for doing that and they're going to do it again. So we never want to reward bad behavior. We're always just thinking we can ignore bad behavior, but we never want to reward it. Which is why I say when we work with young horses, I never stop and let them look at anything I just go in, I act like there's nothing there, and I keep going. We would never want hor young horses to get in the habit of thinking that they can stop and look at every little thing that they do. So that's usually the biggest mistake that most people make with hot horses, thinking they're calming them down, and all that really does is reward them for the bad behavior. So we just keep going with what we're doing. So now, with this lunging work, I would have liked to have seen you do the work in hand first and get the horse stretching if you can. Now, you said you're having trouble, like, for instance, here, you're using this, uh, what are you using there for a whip? Looks like you have a buggy whip or something there. Now, I would certainly highly recommend that at some point uh, you start riding with an actual lunge whip. Maybe that's one of the, you know, how you're using it here. Um, I suggest to people all the time, you know, um, that looks like you are using a lunge whip there. I just couldn't see the end of it. Um, 
but the way you're going about it, trying to get it underhanded, by the time you get around to there, it's kind of too late. So I suggest to people all the time, if you want to learn how to lunge, take a lunge whip in your backyard and put a target on a tree and practice with both hands until you get to the point where you can easily and immediately tap on that spot over and over again. You want to pick a target that's about where the horse's fleshy part of the buttocks is above the hock there, which is normally where we want to touch a horse with the whip when we do. We either touch them there or right where your leg would go, or if you're very good at it, you can tap them on the shoulder if they're starting to flip around on you. Now this walk is starting to look pretty good. I want it to be more consistent. And sometimes just know that sometimes we act for more activity and we don't always get it. Sometimes that's not a good thing. Sometimes letting them slow down a bit. In other words, we want to work them where they can best stretch. So if we hurry them, and hurrying them ends up with the head up in the air, now you're ending up with a better stretch here, so that's a good thing. But if our hurrying, if we hurry them and they end up just going faster with their head up in the air, that doesn't really, uh, isn't accomplishing what we want. And there's always a point with every horse where if we go past a certain speed, the inertia, that is the mass of the horse's body going forward, will push it onto the forehand. So we always want to be sure that we're not going too fast, that we're not getting them too active. The goal of activity is to get the horse to engage forward under the body, but if we get too much activity, then the horse just pushes itself onto the forehand because we have the horse going faster than it can deal with. So you had some really good work in that walk here and there. I want to be more consistent, so I was suggesting if you can do the work in hand first before you do the lunging. But now that we're getting to the trot work, he's starting to stretch a little better. Sometimes it's difficult to keep the walk work because it, it is so um, a gait that doesn't have a lot of natural impulsion in it. So it can be difficult to keep them active enough in the walk. We can see his trot here while he's starting to stretch, but we can see this very short stride that he's not really pushing up into his back at all. It's just kind of a, a short, flat step that he's taking here. But once again, watch as he stretches down, you'll see that, you know, he is going to get a lot more flexion in his hock. So the more he stretches down, the better the action of the hock. And that's what we're always looking for. When we think about what the horse is doing, it's the movement that we're interested in, not the position of the head and neck. So a horse can have a very pretty head and neck position, a la Tennessee walkers and, you know, and these kind of horses, but they're all completely upside down and on the forehand, no matter how high their knees come. That's the thing to understand again. Having the horse lift its knees up has nothing to do with collection. Now this is starting to look quite good here. It's a little bit regular. Wanted to be a little bit deeper, but those moments that you're getting them all the way there, so every time you lose that, I'd bring him a little closer to me and try to get him to yield the hindquarters a little bit more. At least what we're looking to do. If he gets a little fast, like now he's starting to get a little bit fast and he's running with his head up, then we want to slow him down because he's getting to that point where that's too much activity and he's getting faster than he can stretch. In other words, just starts to run flat. But there he slowed down a little bit. You got him a little closer to you. So you're doing exactly the things I would want you to do. That is, if he gets too fast, you bring him closer to you. Use the circle. Let the circle do the work for you so you don't have to do a lot of pushing or pulling. Just keeping him steady in that active pace, bringing him on a little smaller circle and asking him to yield the hindquarters. This is also why you get that sense this horse is always trying to spin to the outside with you because he's not yielding the hindquarters enough to move them away. Then you wouldn't have that trouble with them trying to spin on you. As long as the horse is trying to position his hindquarters at you, you see the way this one is doing, he comes around there, he's trying to push his head to the outside. So the main thing you have to do here is just ask him to yield the hindquarters more. So I would turn that whip around so you can run it out and give him a little tack with it when you need to. But the work in hand will also help you with all of that. So if you find that your lunge session is just, you know, a lot of just chasing him around without getting him in a good frame, go back and do the work in hand first and then go back to the lunge line. So you're getting really stretching in the work in hand. Now, it is necessary, you mentioned in your, in your thing about doing the work in hand, not using a whip. It's necessary. You're not going to get anything without a whip. So if it means taking the saddle off and doing it without the saddle, if you find that the saddle is in your way, as you commented in your notes, um, fine, get rid of the saddle, do it without a saddle. But uh, you need to carry a whip with you when you do the work in hand or you're just never going to get much. We don't want to be pushing on them with our hands because um, you're just never going to get a very effective uh, 
response to that. So you need to carry the whip when you do the work in hand. So bear that in mind in order to get good at it. Same thing with the lunge whip, you know, taking it home and practicing with it. Put a target on a tree someplace where you're away from horses so you can snap it with one hand and the other, just running that lash out and tapping it. We don't want to ever hit a horse very hard with the whip. It doesn't take a hard hit. We want to be able to just put that lash where we want it at the end of the whip onto the horse. So you also mentioned his thing when you get to the working hand of him grabbing. That's just typical baby stuff that he's gotten away with. And, you know, when they do that thing of snapping, you know, trying to bite at the line, just give them a tap and send them forward. In other words, discipline them for it. You can even say no to them. There's nothing wrong with that. Just like you do when you train your dog or cat. Every time they're about to do something, you say no. You know, so use your voice commands. It's very, uh, very powerful, effective. And, of course, you can use the voice command when you're not next to the horse. In other words, uh, if you're in the cross ties and the horse is trying to bite at the cross ties, if you have an effective sounding voice and can do a sharp no that, that tells the horse no, once they understand what that means, you can use that wherever you are. So don't be afraid to use the word no. Vocal commands are very important for young horses. We establish a lot of rapport by using our voices, either to calm them or, or to say no, as an instance. So once again, when we need to get that, uh, we want that moment of disobedience to be at the moment of the disobedience. So if we're going to, so a good sharp no, just that the horse is starting to grab at those reins, is enough to, to discipline them. And if that doesn't work, a little tap with that whip. On, again, why you want to have the whip with you when you're doing the work in hand. Because that is what you'd want to do, is give him a little tap and just send him from behind forward again when he tries to bite at the rein. Getting a little creative here <laughs> with the slow-mo. And notice how much better it looks in the slow-mo when he does start to stretch down. You can see that in those moments a minute ago when his head was up in the air, you could see how his hind legs were just kind of being left behind and how... Because the forehand isn't swinging through, you can see his hindquarters were actually coming higher, which is what not what we want to have happen. We want to have the horse lower behind, which is what tells us the horse is beginning to come under the body. So no matter what we do, if you see many upper level dressage horses today, supposed dressage horses, and you watch them piaffing and massaging, their hips go higher than the withers when they do it. And that's because the back is not round. So when the back is not round, the thrust of the hind legs has nowhere to go except to push the hindquarters up into the air and back down again, which is absolutely worthless in terms of efficiency of movement. Always remembering that's what dressage was supposed to be all about from the very beginning was to develop efficiency of movement. When you, you know, back when people actually had to count on horses to go long distances, you know, you didn't want to waste that movement going up in the air. You want all the energy to send you forward, to send you somewhere to the to your goal of getting someplace. And, of course, that's what's led to so much of the degradation of the horse sports is that people don't go anywhere anymore, especially dressage riders. Dressage riders have become very ring-bound. Um, I see many of them who are upper-level horses who are scared to death of their own horses, scared to take them out on a trail you know, uh, or anything else. You know, They're afraid that if the footing isn't a million-dollar footing, it's going to lame them up. Well, it probably will if they're, li if they're riding them upside down, but no amount of million-dollar footing will, will ultimately save you if you're riding your horse hollow. It's going to destroy the horse's legs no matter what kind of footing you are on in time. There, now good stretch there. Now that's the walk we're looking for right there. Notice how all of a sudden when he got there, all of a sudden that walk took off. It was almost like a wave. We could literally see the wave moving through the horse. So that was the first moment right there that you got him where he really should be. And that was good. So we want to work to be able to maintain that. So once again, thinking in terms of what's important, we know that in terms of muscle building, the only muscle building is going to happen when the horse is in the right frame. So the sooner we get to the right frame and don't wear the horse out in the process of getting into the right frame so that each step he has is, is important and does have you know, uh, a function in creating a better horse, if you will. So look at how much better that walk is. All of a sudden, li literally, you could see how that wave just built up in the back and moved through the horse, and all of a sudden he started swinging. Not as good as it was a moment ago, but that was really the right direction. But even the walk is regular now. Before this moment, it was not regular at all. It was very irregular. That is slow, fast. The steps weren't the same length. And now that's happening beautifully. What a difference. That's what you're looking for. So from that moment, then you're really making good forward progress with your horse. It's like anything else. It's how much time you spend. You know, what's that saying about uh, 
10,000 hours it takes to be good at something, well, the same thing is true of the horse. It takes hours of repetition to bring the horse to the point where it can respond instantly. So it's just like for the horse. It's like horses aren't, you just don't give them an idea and then, oh, it's all perfect. They have to develop skills just like we have to develop skills. No horse is ever just someone just jumps on them and, and, and they are a good ride. <laughs> you know, it takes time to develop them. But really good walk here. This is what you're looking for. So from the time that we saw that big wave move to the horse and get into the stretch, this has been really good work. And just know that from that point, even if you didn't do anything but walk, you could develop the horse beautifully once you get to the horse to develop over its back. Then you can do as much walk as you want to until the horse is, you know, to the point at which the horse is bored with it. Always remembering that we always want to keep our workouts with horses, you know, between about 30, 45 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour at the outside. After an hour, you start tearing the horse down. The only time that we'd ride longer than an hour, even then it's done um, intermittently, would be if we're, in a you know, we're training endurance horses. And most of that work is going to be done at a walk in the stretch. We say about the pioneers, they didn't gallop across the country, they walked across the country. No horse, no matter what kind of horse they are, can actually gallop very far. So really good into that stretch there, much better than what we saw before. Now the stride's a little bit longer. When he gets to that place, it starts to look nice, really good there. Could have a little more swing in it, but once again, I'd rather go slowly with more swing. And you can see now in this little slow motion bit that you do have a, a little bit of bounce to the trot there. He's starting to, you can see how now he's starting to push himself along. See how the horse is carried forward, the upward, the thrust of the hind legs. Now look how he's sinking a little bit behind, and that's pushing up into the back and sending the horse forward, which is why the shoulder looks free. Always fun to do a little bit of slow motion work. You can really study closely what the horse is doing. I love to watch horses move. And uh, once again, I've been training horses since I was five years old with my father. And uh, I've always fascinated with watching them work and, uh, and watching how they move. My father analyzed every horse that ever came across the TV screen for me from the time I can remember at three years old. So I've been analyzing horses a long time, but my father taught me how important it was to look at the horse that you're trying to train. Don't just like think, oh, I'm just riding it. Look at it and see what it looks like. How is its body changing? How is its mind changing? For the better or the worse. So just keep trying. This looks like you're that typical problem of him trying to spin out on you a little bit there. And that will just go away in time, the more that he doesn't get away with it. That's why it's so important that we don't make mistakes in training, that because it takes so long to get horses in the idea of, oh, this is what I do, and there's no variant from it. This is what is expected, and they start doing it when they've been taught correctly. But look how even though he's not stretching all the way down, we're still getting a decent amount of thrust off the hind leg. Look how nicely he's holding the tail out, too, which is always a nice sign that they're lifting the tail out away from the body. Of course, it always means that they're getting to, ready to relieve themselves as well. But, uh, for instance, that's what Tennessee walking horses and saddlebreds were doing by breaking their horse's tail. A horse that's moving correctly over its back will lift its tail uh, out and away from the body a little bit. It won't carry it hanging straight down. If you ever go to try a horse and the tail hangs straight down between the body, it's usually a sign they're drugged. Or even these days, they're even doing things like Botoxing tails and things like that and cutting the nerves in tails so the horses don't swish their tails. It's just amazing to me what people are willing to do to, to mask their own mistakes. Really nice now. Now that's getting to a really good place there. And see how when he gets to that stretch, you really start to see him bounce along. His stretch could be a little bit deeper at times. But even there, we see how the underside of the neck is still relaxed. If you see any tension in the underside of the neck, you know that the horse is pulling with the shoulders. That's why they tense the underside of their neck, because they're using their shoulders to pull with, instead of just to let the hind legs lift the body. And then all they have to do is let the shoulders swing forward. Really good stretch there. Now we're getting to a really good place. And as I said, you know, you talked about not being around other people and, uh, or rather being in a place where nobody does what you do. You have to just not worry about that. And that's what I created Art to Ride for, so all you folks out there would have a community that you can work with. I watched that happen many times over the years of going and 
I'd meet people who were enthusiastic about riding correctly at a clinic someplace, but with no, as soon as I left, you know, with all of their friends in their ears telling them what's wrong and what's right all the time, it's very hard to keep people on track. So it's been wonderful having the Art to Ride community now because people who are trying to learn something better, a better way to do something, have a backup. You know, just remember, no one ever wants to be wrong, and that's the trouble with people is, you know, they see you doing something that's not what they do, and they instantly want to help you conform to them, <laughs> you know, the conformist mentality. So that was getting to a good place. So we just have to ignore those people and just know that, you know, in two years, most of them, uh, most of their horses will be finished or will be worse than they are now, and yours will have blossomed into something. And you can say, well, this is what happens when you do this. When you do the other, you end up with a lame horse that you can't ride anymore. Unfortunately, today, most people have come to think that they spend more time with veterinarians than they spend riding their own horses because of uh, that being kind of the approach of the trainers, that it's, it's all some veterinarian miracle that needs to happen. And this will solve all, all of your problems. You know, if you're seeing a lot of veterinarians, there's probably something very wrong with what you're doing. Not that they aren't necessary, but... Uh, you know, once again, all of these things people have been told these days that are necessary, injection, maintenance injections and things like this being the worst one. Injections are not a cure, folks, no matter what you have been led to believe. It is nothing but legal painkiller being injected into joints so that you can keep doing the same work that injured the joint to begin with. It's not a cure, and it's, it's certainly not a, um, a cure, <laughs> let's put it that way. <laughs> So when you work in hand here, see, once again, the biggest problem is you, you're just going to have to get yourself a whip in your hand so that you can use it correctly. It just doesn't work to do this without it because you really have nothing, you know, you have no legs. So it's like trying to ride with no leg. You have your hands and just being able to sort of, uh, do you have a whip in your hand? Difficult to see there. I don't think you do. But my point being is the work in hand, you've got to get more stepping over and without a whip in your hand. So if you find that the saddle is in your way, as she mentioned in her notes, just take off the saddle and work without the saddle to do the work in hand. And you can always put the saddle back on. I know that's a step, but it's, uh, it's an important one that you learn to do the right things with the work in hand. Because really what you'd like to do is the work in hand before you do the lunging. And then you can get the horse really stretching in the work in hand, then put them on the lunging, and then you spend less time going around with the horse hollow. In other words, you get more quality steps that are going to lead you to something. Same thing there, like if you see the horse starting to bite at you like that or biting at the rein, that's where you want to take the whip and just give him a little sharper rap with it when he does that and say no. Horse can learn the word no. It's an important thing like anything else. So it's again, then if he's in the cross ties and you're across the aisle from him, you can yell no. and They will understand what that means, or a sharp no. You don't have to yell it, but you get the idea. The voice can be a very strong um, influencer. So you're starting to get a pretty good stretch here, but once again, without the whip there, you're not really able to get any sideward step, and you need to get more sideward step to help you push the back up, which your work in hand would all be much more effective. But now, look at it this way, though. I mean, you're working in the right direction, and I know you have some, some trepidation having gotten hurt on this horse before, and you want to have that smart trepidation. Most people, you know, should be more trepidatious about what they do with horses, which is uh, how so many people, you know, are lulled into a sense of security because they think these animals are their pets. But, you know, once again, it has nothing to do with that. If the horse decides to spook at something, and there's where you'd want to take the whip and just, you know, you don't hit him on the mouth ever. You just give him a sharp tap with the whip and say no, and then send him on again when he does that kind of stuff. That's him just trying to take over and, uh, and be a little, little bossy with you. And that's where if you had a whip, a little tap would quickly straighten him out. And once again, use the word no with it so he learns what that means. And as I said, just do it without the saddle on, so if the saddle is in your way. But you need to get that whip going in order to, for this to be very effective and to be able to, you know, do the chain. We're talking about being able to discipline him over the biting and the sort of, there's no big deal. It's just a little baby habit which will go away, but you want 
to be able to discipline the horse for something that it does. And teaching them the word no is an important thing. Of course, coming back from your injury, just know getting back on riding, you know, that you need to get yourself a little fitter than you are. I can see here, it's, as everyone does. You know, the fitter you are, the better rider you will be. Or as I like to say, the uh, you'll never be a better rider than you are fit. So if you're a little trepidatious in the saddle, you know, getting yourself into a more superior level of fitness will also help you feel, as it does with everything else, you know, help you feel um, secure in what you're doing in life and with working with horses as well, because you need to be agile, you know, and you need to be supple to work with horses, because th things happen very quickly, as we know. Things kind of go along okay, so, so many people are injured by young horses, you know, because they get lulled into a sense of, oh, he's pretty secure in the ring, let's go out for a trail ride. You know, just simply knowing that with any young horse, it, you know, it takes a year to two years to fully uh, implement the foundation work where the horse is really quite dependable in all situations. So you can either do that and take the time or you can try to do as many of the Western people this idea that you kind of sack horses out. You know, we've seen people that, you know, tie horses to the ground or lay them on their sides and then they cover them with tarps and all this kind of stuff. A horse that you do with that with, yes, you can do that, and they will become very um, non-reactive to anything. <clears throat> but that's really scaring them to death. That's really, the idea of that is submitting a horse to the point that they just give up the will to live and say, okay, well, kill me. I'll lay here and do whatever you want to me. Um, and a horse that has had that done to it is never going to get into the work and ultimately be a real partner in the work and really try for you. Once you have killed the mine... Um, the way these people do with this kind of sacking out stuff where, the, you know, once again, they just overexpose the horse to everything and the horse just gives up and just uh, says, kill me, is basically what they're doing. So once again, you're never going to, a horse is really going to try for you in the work that have been trained in that way. But if you bring them up in, over time, teaching them to trust you and work with you, then you can get them to do pretty much anything you want to do without also killing the mind in the process. So something to think about there. So work in hand, you just really got to get rid of the saddle off, that's what it takes, um, and start learning to use your whip so that you can use that more effectively and get a little more out of your work in hand work. So always knowing that in the beginning, all we're looking for is the horse to stretch and the walk, so don't even think about trotting till you get a good walk. If that takes a little while, that takes a little while. But, you know, just know that you still need to get yourself in a little better shape than you are in. So start working on that. In the meantime, get this walk worked out till you can get them really stretching really well in the walk. Starting off pretty well here. Starting to get active. There's nothing wrong with taking your time. And once again, it's all about effective work. Uh, it's better to do 15 minutes of good walk work over the back than it is to do two hours of trotting around upside down. In fact, much better. Remember, every step that we take with a horse disengaged, like some that we see, um, you just know that every time you take, it's like your car. If you overload one side of the car, fill the trunk full of bricks, you're going to wear out your tires or you have no suspension in the car. Same thing is true of horses. Horses that have no suspension, yes, it's like a car. A car will still run with no suspension, but the whole car will fall apart from the shock you know, and the bumps to all its system every time it hits a bump with no shock absorbers. Well, the same thing is true of the horse. It's not that you can't ride them. You can, but what damage are you going to do in the process? So, <laughs> like what we see here, you know. Yes, you can canter, but if the horse is upside down bracing against its front legs, all you're doing is wearing the front legs out. And yes, you might be able to do it, but should you? That's the question is, should you do what you're doing? Or is what you're doing going to have lead to a good effect or lead to anything other than a horse that just goes lame prematurely? You know, the good news, this horse is 14 years old, but that's not an old horse. You know, many horses you've seen, uh, like with our stable Contigo, we just saw a clip of not, uh, recently. He's going to be 25 years old this year, and he still goes every day. He's perfectly fine. Gets no injections. Um, perhaps at our barn is over 20 now. And you'd think these horses are just well-maintained eight-year-olds is what they look like, which is what they should look like. Same thing with people. Most people's health problems are caused because they're not maintaining their bodies correctly. They don't eat right. They don't exercise right. If they exercise, they exercise too much or in the wrong way. 
you know, all these gyms today get by, they all have millions of subscribers and nobody ever goes because they go and they don't teach them how to work out correctly, so they go and they hurt themselves and they don't come back and keep paying the monthly pay payments. Well, people are doing the same thing with their horses. The idea of exercise is to get you fit without injury. Should be the same of the horse or without any long-term injuries that just slowly debilitate the horse, which is what a lot of riding does to horses. And if your horses aren't lasting well into their 20s, no matter what they're doing, you know, if you go and you watch the best people in the world, watch Marcus Enning, he just retired his horse last year that had been doing Grand Prix jumping for 20 years, retired at sound. You know, those kind of guys are the people that we need to emulate, not these splash in the pan. Anybody can buy a million dollars if you've got a million dollars to spend and buy a million dollar horse these days and go win a bunch of ribbons until the wheels fall off. And unfortunately, that's what's happened. Then we have all these same wheels falling off trainers training people. And this led to the vicious downward spiral of our horse sports. So you're doing a great job here. Let's reiterate a little bit. We want to get back to the... Uh, I'd like to see you work in hand first. I'd like to see you beginning to make yourself carry that whip when you do it so you can get more discipline from him and get a little more crossing over. The same thing, that will also increase uh, and help your lunging technique. Um, I'd like to see you go home and practice with your lunge whip, you know, till you're better at it so you can tap the horse when you need to so you can get those hindquarters moving away from you. And the work in hand. Good job here. We'll favor from art to ride. See you next time.